Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Selena Donald. Um, I own a consultancy called The Bulb, and I'm going to be talking to you about lessons that we can learn from mega events. I think it's really good first to start about why I'm here and why I'm talking about mega events. So I've been fortunate enough to be involved in quite a few different big, large scale events over the years. The first being the England 2018 World Cup bid, which, you know, maybe <laughs> a bit of a, a big and controversial start to uh, my career, um, particularly at the moment seeing Qatar, but we'll come on to that. Um, then I moved on to working on the London 2012 opening closing ceremonies. And that actually was, um, when we talk about lessons learned, where I got the inspiration to start the bulb. So I was appointed as part of the Sustainability Committee for London 2012, and we were tasked with creating four of the world's biggest shows as sustainably as possible. And we did really well, which some of the learnings I'll learn from. And what I took away from that was, if we can do it on four massive shows, why aren't we doing it on exhibitions and meetings and brand activations? Like, if we can do it at this massive scale, surely we can take these learnings and make it you know, very easy to do it on the smaller scale. So I did ponder on that for a bit, and I worked out in the Middle East for a little bit. Um, I worked on the Rio 2016 Olympics, and then set up the Bulb in 2015. Um, we um, work with agencies and brands to consult on their sustainability strategies, help them measure and embed sustainability into their culture and their staff behaviors. Think about how they can be more creative. For me, sustainability is the best creative brief you can ever get because you've got to think outside the box. You've got to think differently to how things have always been done. Um, most recently, I worked um, on the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games and led the sustainability strategy for the opening closing ceremonies. Um, and that's going to be a case study that I refer to quite a lot because it's so new um, and we achieved quite a lot. So let's just set the scene. Why is sustainability so important? We've got eight years to reduce our carbon emissions by 50%. And seven years ago, scientists said that in order to avoid the world's worst extreme weathers and catastrophic impacts, we needed to keep the world's temperature to 1.5 degrees compared to 150 years ago. We're currently at 1.2. And I think all of us can agree over the last year, we've seen insane weather. We've seen massive amounts of flooding and heat waves and drought. And that's at 1.2. And Time is running out to even meet the limit of 1.5. It's not a target, it's a limit. So it means that every industry, every single industry, needs to pivot to a more sustainable way of working. That means changing to renewable energy, means looking at the resources we use, what we consume, how we make things, where we use materials. And that's every single industry. Our industry, is incredibly important in this huge global plan and transition to a net zero economy. We're an industry of influence. You know, one of our industry is one of the only industries that sits across every single other industry in the world. You know, we are responsible for promoting products, for engaging people in different behaviors, for creating narratives that people take away and, and really own. You know, like when we think about the events and the meetings we're running, what, what message are we giving out on those platforms? And so we really do have an opportunity to take this away and become the people that move that climate story forward. How can we use our platforms? And of course, no bigger platform than a mega event. And when we talk about mega events, we say large scale events which have an international market and are all, and organized by a special authority. So we're talking about Olympic Games, FIFA World Cups, Super Bowl, Commonwealth Games. Huge events, huge platforms, massive sponsorship, massive broadcasting. The Birmingham Commonwealth Games was viewed by 28.6 million people. I'm about to say billion then, that would be really going into the future. Um, so what 28.6 million people viewed into the opening ceremony. That is a massive stage. That is a huge amount of people for us to be able to tap into and showcase new ways of working, doing, creating. And these aren't just elite sport events. They're tourist attractions, they're places for meetings. In the Olympics, every country has a house 
I worked on the British House for the Rio Olympics. So a space where they entertain and create business meetings and showcase their country to the world. Um, sponsorship deals are through the roof. Look at Super Bowl, how much they pay a celebrity to just do a tweet. Didn't Katy Perry get like millions for one tweet during a Super Bowl advert? Um, but there are also ways that we create urban redevelopment. So Ken Livingstone, when he won, the, he was the London mayor when we won the Olympics for London. And he famously said he didn't do that for three weeks of sport. He did it because he wanted the government to give him billions of pounds to redevelop the East End. So he's, his focus was bigger than just an Olympic Games. It was how do I get money to redevelop this area of my city? So these aren't just games, they're legacies. However, they're huge. So this is the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger. And I think that really encapsulates the growth of the mega event. You know, when we think about how big they're becoming, you know, and how much they take over. Um, it really is the largest project that you can do today. They've grown 60 fold over the last 50 years. 13 times faster than the average GDP, which is insane. 360,000 people attended London. That was, that was accredited um, personnel, 360,000 accredited personnel for the London Olympics. But only 3% of those were actually athletes, which is just insane. As I said, 28.6 million tuned into the Birmingham Commonwealth Games opening ceremony. This is so small, I can't barely see it. I, might, I must be getting old. Um, and 1.1 billion of sponsorships spent on the FIFA World Cup for Qatar. And then let's not forget the carbon footprint. So COP had a carbon footprint of 102,000 tons, and that, that's pretty big. So just trying to like put into context the, the actual impact of these events on a country, a host city, on an industry, um, on a sponsorship is massive. And there's a reason we do them. You know, they generate that once in a lifetime experience. Everyone here, I imagine, has got some sort of like mega event memory, you know, like been to the Olympics, watch the World Cup, skive off work to watch the World Cup. You know, like it's, it's so it's just an amazing opportunity to just be with your friends and enjoy something together. It brings the country together. London joined the London Olympics was amazing. Like the atmosphere was so good. It puts unknown cities in the spotlight. Sochi, who even knew about Sochi before the Winter Olympics? Like, you know, it's new cities that get a platform and Birmingham is a great example of that. Like since the London uh, Commonwealth Games, it's won three more massive events, the UK Athletics. It's starting to bid for things like the Eurovision and other places. It's almost given the confidence to the city to start bidding for global events, for huge events that really matter to that industry. We generate infrastructure like the East End of London. You know, there, there's a lot of talk around the legacy of London 2012 and like the positivity around it. Um, and, you know, you only have to go to the Queen Elizabeth Park to see that's still in action, which is amazing. And also they provide learnings for our industry. The ISO 2012 One framework came out of London 2012 and it's now a well-known industry framework for sustainability, which is incredible. But they are problematic and cities are becoming wary. Only two cities bidded for the last Olympics, for the 2024, Paris and LA. And no cities bidded for the next one. So Paris has got it next year, uh, 2024, and LA has got it after in 2028. And that's because of the money that it requires, but also everything else that goes into it. Um, Birmingham only won the Commonwealth Games by default because Durban decided not to go ahead with it. And it's just the money that's needed in order to get your city to a level that's expected by these organizations is massive. And it can also go a bit wrong. So we're seeing a lot of press at the moment around Qatar. They've made a huge statement that they're carbon neutral, the most carbon neutral event ever, most carbon neutral World Cup ever. They've estimated a footprint um, of 3.6 million tons of CO2, which is massive. However, scientists have looked into this and they actually said it's probably three times the amount of that at 10 million tons, 
which is a massive amount of emissions. The way that they're trying to uh, claim carbon neutrality is by offsetting. But the offsetting schemes they're investing in aren't big enough to take that amount of emissions. And if they're not even emitting all of the emissions, for instance, when you dig deep into the strategy, they're only um, counting one flight. They're not counting return flights. I don't think all those people are staying in Qatar after the World Cup finishes, so we really do need to count those flights. In the news today, 20,000 um, people are actually not staying in Qatar because there's not enough accommodation. So people are flying in and out of Qatar, 500 flights a day from Dubai and Bahrain. Again, that's not being counted for because they, it was the unknown. So it's these huge things and massive impacts that are happening. And really, when we look back at this and the emissions that we've created, what are we going to feel? What are our next generation going to feel? Was it the right thing to do? The other issue is the seven stadiums that have been built from scratch. What's going to happen to them afterwards? And we've seen other host cities, South Africa, um, built stadiums all across South Africa, and they're all sat empty. Rio, the same. Is Qatar a big sporting um, nation that is going to fill seven stadiums every year with different sports? I'm not sure. I'd love to see it happen or see some sort of legacy happen, but the history shows that doesn't generally happen. Um, one of their projects is to plant 16,000 trees. However, 16,000 trees is only enough to offset 11 Qatari citizens every year. So it does not even cover the 3.6 million tons or the 10 million tons that their emissions are starting to showcase as. But these events have massive budgets. And despite all of that around Qatar, there will be amazing learnings that we can all look at and take away. And they create frameworks that all of our events can learn from. So I've taken 10 key lessons that I've learned over the years that I think you guys could take away and implement into your events tomorrow. Um, I'm going to focus on the UK, because it's where I've got most experience, and looking at London, looking at COP26, looking at Birmingham, um, and just be able to share with you some of the things we did um, that I think people could learn from and start to bed into your, your agency, your organization. So teamwork really does make the dream work. Um, put your sustainability strategy at the heart of your business. It will drive further progress. Bring your team on board, train them, get them to own it, give them accountability, get them engaged, create a brand identity for it, nurture it. Add a budget line for sustainability. You know, how are you going to make changes if you've not got budget allocated to it? And, con and train your staff and just continually reinforce those messages. Um, for Birmingham 2022, we had a huge amount of people coming on board in a really short space of time. And so we were like, how are we going to get across all of these sustainability commitments we've made um, to everyone? And so we created an onboarding video. It saved so much of my time, because it meant that I didn't have to repeat myself twice a week for six months. But it was a 15-minute video that people sat and watched, and it set out exactly our commitments, what we expect of them, what we expect from our suppliers, and how we're going to work as an organization. And it had a great effect, um, which we'll come on to as I work through um, the different learnings. But Birmingham really was um, a great platform to be able to showcase some sustainability leadership. And this is probably why. So the organizing committee m asked the production company to commit to 19 sustainability and social value clauses in our contracts. And every month, I reported to the organizing committee on our progress. So putting that in our contract straight away meant that we hired me as um, a consultant to run this. But it meant that we had to put it into all of our planning. And I came on board before any, like right at the beginning so that we could build this in from the outset. These pillars really helped us to structure all of our learnings moving forward. And your supply chain, all of us know that we're only as good as the people we work with. And we need to get them on board. This is a model that we have used in London 2012, and then we put it into Birmingham 2022. And it's the way that we can make it really clear to our suppliers that sustainability needs attention, we need evidence, and we need commitment. 
So we did a workshop at, in London 2012, right at the beginning, before we even released any RFPs, and we invited people who thought that they might be interested in working with us to um, just hear how we were going to work, what we expected of them. We made our mission really clear. We wanted these to be the most sustainable ceremonies ever produced. And if you want to work with us, this is what we expect from you. And it meant that we engaged them early. There were no nasty surprises. They knew from the outset what we wanted. In Birmingham, we gave a 10% weighting to responses in bids from sustainability and social values. So we asked six questions, we asked for evidence, and all of that meant that we could really see who were going to be our partners, who were like-minded, who could give value for money, but also meet our commitments across sustainability, diversity, ethical sourcing, local community benefit. And it meant we could really see that from the beginning and see who were going to be our partners. But it also meant that we could start that two-way flow of conversation. And actually, on London 2012, doing this and opening up the door to talk to our suppliers meant that we swapped out plastic in all of our fireworks into cardboard. And that was like a new thing that we did with Titanium, who were the fireworks supplier. I'm sure people, some people in the room will know about them. But they've gone on to use that now in every um, like firework display that they do. So that's a great legacy from London 2012. And that's from reinforcing that sustainability message and saying, this is what we expect of you. We also added a clause in our contract, which held our suppliers accountable. So we said that we need, one, data from you in order to measure our carbon footprint. And two, we need you to abide by these commitments and behaviors. Um, and that meant that we had a bit of a stick <laughs> with the carrot because they'd signed that contract. And that's something that I'm trying to build in now with the agencies I work with, because it works. It really works, just being able to hold people to a contract. And then working locally, like in Birmingham, that was one of our biggest wins. We explored the local area in the West Midlands, and we tried to find suppliers that would not only be able to work provide the services and goods we needed, but that we could also build back into that local economy. So 31% of our suppliers were from the West Midlands on the Commonwealth Games opening closing ceremonies. And that meant we had a really positive impact on our carbon footprint as well. So it was a win-win. Not only did we support the local area, but we also had a positive impact on our footprint because it brought down the amount of journeys. And so 58% of our supply journeys were from within 50 miles. It, that really helped, <laughs> that final footprint. And we also help generate some more skills in the local area. You know, when, it, when is that sort of scale of event going to be coming to Birmingham again? How can we generate some upskilling, giving people opportunities? And actually, half of our workforce was, it was the first um, ceremonies they'd ever worked on as well. So it's just about being able to give people opportunity that might not have ever had it and be able to build that. And as a consequence, we put four million back into the local economy, um, which we're really proud of. And we also, found some real treasures and gems of um, suppliers, one of which I'm going to share a case study of with you. Lesson five, Ooh. energy, power. It's the elephant in the room, really, because we all know we need to transfer over to a renewable energy source, but we know that there's a cost. Um, one of my biggest goals on the, London, uh, the Birmingham Commonwealth Games was to power our rehearsal site, which was a huge disused MG um, site. Um, not the most glam place to work at all, especially in, a, in the weather. <laughs> but it was um, enough space for a thousand people to rehearse every day. But it needed a lot of power. And one of the big decisions we made was to transfer over to a HVO generator with biofuel rather than diesel. This did cost £20,000 more. And I will put that out there because that's the biggest question that always comes to me when I share that. Yeah, but it costs more money. It does. It really does at the moment. However, it brought our footprint down considerably. You can see some equivalents here, what we saved. That, for us, it was a decision we made with those social commitments in mind. It wasn't a budget decision. And it was a decision, and I think those decisions we all have to, we're all going to have to do. It's that balance. Do we want to 
pay the green premium and have a more sustainable event which has a positive impact and creates an amazing narrative for our clients? Or do we want to go down the traditional route and save some money? Um, at the moment, that is a, a bit of a decision that everyone has to make. But we were really, really happy that we went with this decision. Um, and it came at the time, you know, when all the tax levies were a bit weird and no one knew how much anything was going to cost. So it, was a, it wasn't even an 11th hour um, decision that got put through. It was like 11.55. But we did it, and I'm really pleased. Um, and I think just on that, actually, um, I'm going to talk about Trace. So we measured all of our ceremonies' impacts through an online carbon calculator called Trace. It's a software run by Isla. Does, has anyone heard of it? I know you have, Cass. <laughs> no one else. I really recommend um, checking that out. But we used, that tr we used Trace to make the decision on this. So we were able to use this carbon calculator to estimate what, it would be, what the footprint would be for diesel and what it would be for HVO. And that helped us because it meant that I could go to the powers that be and say, these are, the, these are the facts, this is the footprint. It's not only about the money, it's about the carbon footprint. And it really helped push that decision through. Start thinking circular. This is a big one for me. Like the way that we design, but we think, we create, we design, we build. We have to start thinking circular. It's no longer enough to start building things, using them once and chucking them away or letting them sit in storage. We need to start looking at what we can hire. And if we do need to create something new, how do we make it so it's durable and it can be reused afterwards? It's almost lazy now for a designer and a creator to create something that's just used once. That's no longer the way that we should be thinking. If we're using resources, we should be using them time and time again and giving their value. If not for your client, donate it. Meg in my team has just worked with uh, Verizon, which is a big uh, mobile company in the US, and we've just donated 4,000 assets out of storage to charities across the US. And that story for Verizon is incredible. And it's just about thinking, these might not have any value for your client anymore, but do they have value for someone else? Starting to build that, maybe that like, database of charities or work with a really great um, community, a really great organization called Event Cycle, which I'll come on to. So for me, it's about making fewer, better, longer lasting assets before we think about, you know, one, things that are just use single use. I'm going to dig into a couple of these thoughts. Hiring existing assets. The majority of our closing ceremony stage in the Birmingham Commonwealth Games was hired. Everything that we needed, the, the structure, the steel, the timber, we hired everything and we gave it back. And that was a brilliant win because everyone knows what a get out's like. And at the end of a Commonwealth Games, you are tired. So the fact that we knew a supplier was going to dismantle this and take it back was a win on every account. Also saved us money. We didn't have to get rid of it. So it was a win-win. The only thing we did build was the tower in the middle, and we actually donated all of the metals to a supplier to reuse as well. So again, just thinking about what are we going to do with this afterwards? And can we hire stuff from someone that's already existing? Looking at sustainable materials, I'm actually going off piece from mega events in a way. Um, these are a couple of examples of things I've worked on in the last uh, month. This was the stand we built for Microsoft at COP27. Um, it was made entirely from plywood and cardboard. So we printed directly onto cardboard and um, which, with water-soluble inks, which meant that everything could be recycled. The plywood has been reused. There's a bit of uh, steel timber in there, but that's been sent back to the supplier. Even the furniture was made from cardboard. And it just meant that we could reuse everything, and it gave that sustainable aesthetic. And anything we didn't reuse, we donated to charity or we recycled. We're working with another client and we're building an innovation center and we're making the meeting room table from discarded e-waste. So these are plastic panels of e-waste that have been melted down and now they've been shaped into a meeting room table which creates a brilliant narrative when you go and sit down at the table and it's got a little sign that says this is made from old keyboards and laptops and mobile phones. Um, and it also takes a solution. It, we take away some plastic pollution that needs sorting out. 
So just thinking about those materials, and these are big, you know, I know that we can't do this in every event, but what about different suppliers that can use things like cardboard, real board, non-PVC vinyl, thinking about different ways of replacing the materials that we can't recycle with other, other elements? And that goes back to thinking outside the box and redesigning things to be more sustainable. Total Solutions were my, um, I mean, you shouldn't have a favorite supplier, but they definitely were my favorite supplier on the, on the Commonwealth Games. They went above and beyond to meet our circular economy sustainability commitments. So they built the bull ring and the big tower that you can see here. And at the end of the opening ceremony, they took everything back to a site and dismantled everything. Wood from timber, glues, nails. They hired a crew specifically to do that. We donated all the wood to a social enterprise. We donated like the bollards and the bits and pieces that were a big infrastructure to Birmingham City Council, and it's in the city. All the plants went to Birmingham City Parks. Um, all of the metals went back into their storage to be reused. They did hire a crew to do this, and the reason that I'm really shouting this out is it did take them 10 extra days, which we covered. And so for me, it's really important that we don't expect our suppliers to do this for free. We should be building in time for them to be able to respond to your sustainability strategy. And that should be communicated to your client. If you're working with a big brand who want you to be sustainable, they need to pay for that time because it does take time. But look what can be done if, it, if, um, if they do do that. Like we had zero waste from this huge structure because we spent the time pulling it apart and being able to recycle, repurpose, give away, donate. Um, and that's one of the really great stories of this, especially when that is like the main sort of um, stage and set piece as well. It means that we can really demonstrate circular economy. But for me, the biggest lesson is building in that time and not expecting suppliers to do it for free. Oh. And this is where I talk about event cycle. Has anyone heard of event cycle? Yeah. <laughs> um, they are an organization that comes, that will partner with you to get rid of your unwanted event assets. Um, they're great friends of mine. It, this is a godsend organization. Um, so when, you are develop when you're developing an event and you know you're going to have leftover set, stage, infrastructure, everything from pens to food to sofas to big signs, they can help you get rid of. And they do it through donating to charities and local organizations across the country. Um, this is some of the wins that they did for COP26. So they were the main partner for COP26 on waste management and asset disposal, and they did incredibly well. Um, there's a lot to work through there, so I, I can share these slides around afterwards as well. Um, I'll speak to Lucy and see how that works. Um, but they are an organization that I would definitely recommend checking out, and then starting again to build that into your budgets. Responsible waste disposal, responsible asset donation. And not only that, they do calculate the social impact, and you can give that to your clients. So it creates that lovely story as well at the end of it. Waste, the really fun bit of all of our events. How do we manage waste? This is a um, updated zero waste hierarchy that I really like, because at the top, it really challenges you to redesign, to rethink the way that you're building things, like really how, how is how has it been done before and how can you make it better? For Birmingham 2022, we had a waste contract with Biffa. I don't know if anyone's heard of them. They're a waste contractor in the UK. And we had a non-negotiable zero waste to landfill clause, which meant they really had to think outside the box for things like geofabric, which we had an insane amount of um, to get rid of without sending things to landfill. They were really brilliant at recycling and donating as many waste assets as possible. And then at the very end, where we couldn't recycle, we did waste to energy. So we avoided landfill through that. Um, I think that's really important. London 2012 did the same. So their partner was CETA. And again, zero waste to landfill. At the very bottom, waste to energy. Um, looking at what you can reuse, repurpose, and just being able to really train your teams on waste management. 
No one wants to do it, but it's so important and it makes your life easier. So when you've got an event plan, think about it. Do the experience through and think about where are your potential waste going to be? Have you got like catering cups? Have you got um, any giveaways which we'll come on to? You know, thinking about where the potential waste could be and be putting a play, uh, plan in place to be able to address it. And giveaways. Who, who has um, so many events with clients who are determined to do a giveaway? And it's always a really rubbish giveaway, like a water bottle, which no one needs anymore because we've got about 15 in our cupboards. That's one of my pet peeves of a sustainable event. Let's give away a water bottle. Um, on that point, though, being able to provide water filters on the Birmingham Commonwealth Games meant that we saved 480,000 water bottles, single-use water bottles, which was a massive deal. And what we did in that onboarding was say to everyone, you need to bring your refillable water bottle to site. And if they didn't, we didn't have any, we didn't have any cups. We just had the water fountains. So people really quickly learn, I've got to bring my bottle. And it worked. It really worked. We saved so much by just instill, in, like instilling that behavior right at the beginning and trying to do that with crew, especially, you know, is always a challenge, but it really worked by the end. Just thinking about, oh, we used um, a water fountain company called AquaAid, and 40p of every pound spent with them goes to charity. So again, a social enterprise that's helping other organizations as you buy from them. Um, all of their bottles are recycled and refilled. They're a great organization that I recommend checking out. And then giveaways, just thinking about like really meaningful giveaways. If your client wants to give something away, how can you take away that single-use plastic? How can you take it away from the usual stuff? Could it be digital? Could it be a QR code? How do we start thinking outside the box with this? Because it's one of the biggest areas of, of um, waste in the events industry. And the next biggest area is uniform. I read a stat the other day that 30 million corporate garments are made every year, and around 95% of them go into landfill. How many t-shirts do we have with an event name on it that we've worn one night? Mine are on like 90s and decorating t-shirts now, but I've got loads, and you know, why do we need to do it? All of us have got black t-shirts and black shirts. Like, can we just like stop printing corporate uniforms and start thinking more like a smaller pin or something that doesn't mean that we have to print all of these massive amounts of uniforms every time we do one day, a one day event. An agency I met yesterday at another event, they've got a cupboard just full of um, branded agency hoodies and t-shirts and they're allowed to borrow them, wear them, wash them and they have to take them back so that it can be reused and worn by someone else. And so as long as it's washed, <laughs> I, think, I think that's a great way of doing it. Like, why do we need to wear a company hoodie more than, you know, for an event that we're going to once? So just thinking a little bit more, like, do, do we need all of these uniforms? Oh, another elephant in the room. We're nearly there, and then I really would love to open up for questions, but travel. Travel is always a big one. Like, how do we, we don't have the vehicles yet that we need. We don't have electric Arctics. We don't, you know, they're not, they're not out there yet. So how do we work with um, our, like, logistics team to be able to create a plan that minimizes transport emissions? That was the big, big uh, like part of our strategy for the Commonwealth Games. We have hundreds of suppliers coming in and out. How do we make that as efficient as possible? As you know, we did a lot of that with local suppliers. Um, in order to actually benchmark and understand what we were doing, we built in the data that we needed for our carbon footprinting into existing templates. So every Olympics has a master delivery schedule, which tracks everything coming in and coming out. We all probably have a similar template for our own events. And I simply added the vehicle and the start postcode. And that meant that I could track all of the emissions coming from our transport in and out. We had 3,700 lines of transport by the end, which was horrible to go through. And I'm so sorry still to, my, um, to Meg and my team who had to go through that line by line, because that was a horrible job. But it meant that we got the data and we could understand exactly where our suppliers were coming from, 
that they were local, that they weren't local, and the emissions generated from that. For our workforce, oh, my slides have gone a little bit out of sync. Going Mac to PC always does that, doesn't it? Um, we reduced the reimbursement of mileage from 40p to 20p because we wanted them to take trains. So if people were going to be out of pocket for traveling up to Birmingham, we kind of encouraged trains instead, and it worked. Um, and we covered the cost of a train. So it meant that we started to get people driving less and using trains. And then eventually we moved everyone to Birmingham anyway, and we did free shuttles from every hotel to the rehearsal site and the stadium. So again, eliminating the need for any transport through Ubers or taxis or cars, we, did the, we put the transport on for them so that we could control it. We also encouraged everyone to get a bike. <laughs> like Birmingham's quite an easy place to cycle around. Um, and so we, we put bike racks everywhere as well. Monitoring cast travel, we had 5,000 cast and we simply just did not provide car parking. So the only car parking we provided was blue badge parking. And the same went for the overall games. There was no car parking, and actually Birmingham just put on free public transport. So it meant that we could really push forward, like, don't drive, take the train, it's going to be easier. Um, and that works at bringing down those emissions. And just thinking about how we build that into our own meetings, like, you know, being there, public transport, making sure that you've got that route, but making sure people know how to get there beforehand. Um, someone told me yesterday, they went to Shambhala Festival, and if you drove, Shambhala gave you a parking pass, and on the pack, back, back of that parking pass, they outlined how many emissions you were generating by driving, and the emissions you could have saved if you got the public transport. So I guess you were driving and being shamed, but it's part of their approach, and it's really amazing to give people that knowledge, you know, to educate. And then final lesson is building in that onward plan. For me, if we can get a plan for every asset that we build before the conclusion of the event, because we're all so tired afterwards and it's just easier just to get it out, get the plan in place, get everyone booked in to collect, get everything sorted beforehand. Being able to do this saved us time, money and assets to landfill. And we gave away 100% of our office and workshop assets. So everything from boxes of pens and post-its to sewing machines, computers, tables, chairs, everything went to local community charities. Um, we did one day where we filled this huge warehouse space and everything went in and we invited the charities to come and they took what they wanted. Um, and it worked. You know, we had nothing left at the end, which was amazing um, and reassuring because I was a bit terrified of what I was going to do with it otherwise. But being able to put that plan in place meant that we got rid of things in a really brilliant way, and it also benefited the community. We've had so many lovely stories about aircon units going to um, old people homes. We gave away um, all of our wheelbarrows and spades from uh, props to the allotment next door to the Alexander Stadium, and which they're now using for the allotments. You know, just identifying like who could use this and where can it go? Um, and just again, thinking about that beforehand, if you know you're gonna have food left over, organize for a charity to come and pick it up at the end of the event and do it beforehand. There are loads of charities working in that space now. There's apps um, that you can use, Fair Share, Olio, there's a few others. So it's really um, easy to do if you just do it before the event finishes. And I guess in, in summary, really just thinking about how you use your event. Like we're so lucky that we've got these platforms and how can we use them to either really make bold statements about sustainability and encourage responsible behaviors and, and consumption or be able to subconsciously do it, you know, just in, this, in the sense of how you build your event, how you monitor it, how you pu push it forward. You know, use your platform to educate people and to inspire people to be more sustainable. Because we have got skills. Everyone in our industry, we are the story makers. We are building these narratives. We're producing, we're creating. And we really do have the influence to change this climate narrative. And I think if we can start building this into every event we do, we can make a massive difference. 
And here are some recommended tools and support. So I've, um, my agency helps a other agencies um, become more sustainable. So please do feel free to reach out. And if we can't help you, we can point you to the right person. Trace and Isla is a UK industry not-for-profit that's progressing the sustainable um, events industry. And Trace is their carbon calculator. Um, Event Cycle, ISO, there are loads of different organizations that are doing brilliant things. So please do reach out and, and see what you can use to help progress you further. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Do we have time? Are there any questions? Do we have time? Oh, brilliant. This gentleman here. What an amazing presentation, Selena. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really, Thank you. Very really inspiring. You know, I come back to the evidence. You know, yeah. we speak about, for example, the World Cup in Qatar and, you know, so it can be another event. It's not finger pointing here, but when there is a mega event like this, you know, how we can be sure that the data they shared, you know, in terms of carbon footprint are really accurate, relevant, yeah. and well measured? It's a really good question because Qatar are working with a really credible um, company um, to, to look at their sustainability strategy. So that in itself, you instantly think, ah, oh, credibility. But there have been other climate scientists that have looked into the data because they felt it was too low and have found the holes. And so the transparency is like, you know, being able to get the data and look at the data and look at the strategy and really be able to challenge it. Um, but I think that is the derailing issue of that World Cup is that putting forward those claims distracts people from actually the issue, which is that we've got lots of emissions that we're not doing anything with um, and that we have to deal with afterwards. Um, and so it is, it's really hard to, to see the credibility. And, and that's why so many brands get called out for greenwashing. You know, um, Innocent Smoothies, which are generally classed as a sustainable brand, they're owned by Coca-Cola, they recently put an advert out on TV and it got pulled because it said it was greenwashing. And so it's so important now, and I think consumers and people um, are becoming more and more vigilant and understanding of the data and what we're expecting and can challenge people. Um, COP27 using Coca-Cola as a sponsor, the outrage was huge and actually they got pulled as a sponsor midway through the, through the event, which is massive and that just shows like the power of people to say actually that's not all right. And so I think it's just about looking at what you read, keeping on top of it and just really challenging and not taking things at face value. Thanks. Any other questions? Wrap up. Well, thank you. Thanks for, for joining. I really appreciate it. I know I'm on day three, so I appreciate you coming.